So tonight might be our half hour class. <laughs> we might be done very quickly. What we will do is we'll finish up tonight talking about the aspects and then we'll start the estimations for the planets next time. And that'll be the second half of it and it'll take just about as long to go through the planets as it does to go through this, maybe a little bit shorter. And then we should uh, be ready to dig in and start doing all kinds of uh, really hard-working astrology. Now, we see that Don has done something. Have any, has anybody else tried the system yet on any of their favorite charts or anything like that? Yeah, Ellen has tried it. Yes. If you um, get a chance to, even if you don't intend to do it with most of your charts or hardly ever to use it at all, try it out. Because it's important to try out even if you don't apply it. Because you get to familiarize yourself with the chart. And familiarization is extremely important. Because even though you're doing it in an intellectual manner, what this is all, all about is uh, like meeting a new friend. And when you're meeting a new friend, it takes a while to get to know them. You, you see them under different kinds of circumstances and they act differently. And you uh, get to know different sides of their character that uh, you wouldn't normally know. When you go through something like this, what you notice is that there are a lot of things that you never noted in the chart before or that you never paid any attention to. And when you have to go through it just as an exercise, at least you're paying attention just once. And doing that is important because otherwise you can just stare at a chart and stare at a chart and stare at a chart and draw a blank. But when you start acting, like when we wrote two word sentences, that does something. And when you start looking at numerical relations between different parts of the chart, you get much, much more understanding of what's going on in the character. If you think the system is incorrect, use it as something that you want to fight against. You know, just, you know, just say, uh, I don't think this is what makes character or that this is what character is like. And so if you use this system and say, no, this isn't right, I'll show you how you tell what's stronger, that is a means for you uh, to begin to work out your own understanding of astrology and your own understanding of horoscope. Not everything, I think, in life is shown by astrology. And when you start trying to compose an estimation system like this, you have to determine what things are ruled by astrology and what aren't. You also have to recognize what's important in life and what isn't. And how do you estimate something? That's a really very hard thing. So the whole quantification process, and especially the parts of relative significance where something is more important than something else is a very hard thing to do. So let's look. We should be out of here in a half an hour, but if everybody chimes in the way it happened last time, this could be a, uh, a full uh, hour, hour, hour and a half. We begin looking at Yokio Mishima. The, uh, if you look at it, the chart has three outstandingly strong aspects. The top three are outstandingly strong, and it's a full 8% before you get down to the next aspect after the first three. The top three put together indicate 60% of all of the activity in the chart, at least all the activity that we're, that we're discussing. And that's really important when you have three that are that strong. They're going to stand out above everything else. All three 
including the mercury conjunct Venus, because the aspects, the other aspects that they form are positive aspects, all three are benefic. So this is someone who basically has born, been born with an astrological silver spoon. Like the most important things that happen to him in life are positive. And his talents are one through easy, positive, agreeable situations. Now the question is, do they describe him? The strongest one is, well, the strongest two are about the same strength, but the strongest one as we're looking at it is Mercury conjoined Venus. They're in Sagittarius, and that's obviously somebody who's expressive and persuasive. Uh, this is probably in his time was the most widely read man in all of Japan. Uh, he was in literary journals. He was published in all kinds of things under all kinds of different names. And he was exceedingly persuasive. And the Mercury conjoined Venus is an, a persuasive aspect. The Saturn trine Pluto indicates a heavy and a dark and a traditional bent. So even though he was constantly expressive, he was pessimistic. It was, you know, like he had this big sense of tradition. Everything had to go according to the way things went in the past. The third of the, of the top three aspects is the moon trying Jupiter which shows an exceedingly fluent emotionality. He could get he could get and be excitable and let it all flow out quite well. So this is pretty accurately describes him. There's only one other aspect of much note, and that's the Mars square Pluto. And since Mars does rule the ascendant, we're going to see that Mars is pretty strong in the chart, so you could almost add that and call it the big four instead of the big three. But the Mars square Pluto shows all of the inclinations toward martial discipline and fascism and things like that. Looking at the chart, three out of the top five aspects involve Pluto. And since Pluto is a very reactionary planet, and a very authoritative planet, that shows very clearly that his chart was uh, permeated with reactionary kinds of things. Let us go back to the samurai days or things like that. Obviously, this is a chart of somebody that has to pour out. And since Venus and Mercury are in the ninth house, it shows that uh, he has plenty of opportunities to publish. Working with publishing houses has to do with both the ninth and the fifth houses. And having uh, two very strong planets like that in the ninth house means that uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's plenty of things. Looking at the numbers more accurately, the mean is 37.45, which is a pretty low mean. And so only four of the planets are above the mean. That's just exactly what you would expect. Uh, and the top three are double the mean, which is really quite an uh, uh, outstanding thing, so that the things that are in his chart are really high profile. So working with this worksheet, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer uh, the way things stand out. Anybody have any comments? Pluto represents reactionary qualities. Uh, right now we're having, with Pluto and Sagittarius in the world, we're having religious reactionism. That is, people want to go back to the way things were, even if they never were that way before. And since Pluto is the small, slowest moving planet, and it has to do with Scorpio, which is either frozen fire or frozen water or both, it uh, indicates something that is not does not like change. And all the psychologists 
that study the phenomena of people who are reactionaries claim that the reaction develops when things change fast and people can't relate to change and they want to go back. Uh, it's almost like, a, you know, like, let's go back and catch up where I, where I lost the train of the conversation, something like that. Or if you're playing a piece of music where you lost the melody, you can go back and try to pick it up. Any more? Yes. That, that means that the mean, that 37.45 is the average aspect strength. Yeah. The 9% is the average uh, percentage of, a, of an aspect. And that means that there are only three above the average. Yes, but it is a kind of change that is going back. It's very rarely ever a change that is going forward. It's not, it's, it's just not progressive. It's like, let's go back to the roots of things, but the roots of things are maybe, may involve uh, a lot of deathly processes. For such a person, the planets wouldn't be difficult. <laughs> For a Venusian person, being courageous is difficult. For a Martian person, being artistic is difficult. And they would say that Venus is a difficult planet. This is those type of people that try to draw with the tip of a football rather than the tip of a pencil. <laughs> All right. Let's look at the Ethel Barrymore chart. Strikingly different. Strikingly different. There's much more tapering. There is a 4% gap between the first and the second aspects. But basically after that, everything else is very, is, is gradated. That's a tapered thing. That means that she's got a good sense of touch. She can do things with high volume, medium, and low volume. One planet is exactly at the mean, and that, uh, one aspect is exactly at the mean, and that is the Mars sextile Jupiter. There are five above it and five below it. Which, again, this is what you'd expect exactly with somebody that has a very regular, even range of touch. Now, the thing is, this mean is stronger than the mean of Mishima, which is why comparing charts doesn't always make a lot of sense. But what counts is the fact that there is this even gradation. Mars enjoying Neptune is clearly a standout, strongest aspect. Jupiter is sextile Neptune for the second one. And having the Neptune in common, I think the way it works out in her chart, especially the Mars Neptune, it says this is somebody that is known for her charisma. She can galvanize energy. She can be very charismatic and is big enough to uh, move audiences or move a whole generation of people by that spiritualized energy. If you look at the um, top four, all put together, uh, they all have in quali common quality of enthusiasm. So what this chart indicates is that the strongest factors in the chart are things that make for enthusiasm. 
This is one of those kinds of people that has an infectious enthusiasm that can thrill other people and uh, carry their interest along with herself. Very, very good. It's an ex very expansive chart. I don't know about the moon sextile Pluto, but everything else in the top half from the mean up, that's from number six to number one, everything else is very expansive. You put that all together with the fact that there are zero aspects to Saturn, saying that there's no hold back in this person, and this is the kind of person that can go all out, full out, without any kind of fearful hitches without any kinds of anxiety. Now that's the kind of person that you want on stage. That's a person that can uh, move a crowd all by herself. The strongest gap is the gap between number one and number two, so it is, in, uh, it is a standout individual. I'm not sure whether this accurately dry, uh, describes your character. It sounds like what you'd expect from an actress. This weekend, I'm starting to read her autobiography now that I've finished with... <laughs> How many biographies are you guys reading, Dan? <laughs> uh, keep, keep asking you. Uh, keep asking you. Uh. That's about all I have to say on that one. Are there any questions? It can... It can. Um, it likes to look back, but it isn't the same, quite the same kind of cold negation that uh, Saturn is. Saturn tries to stop things down altogether. Pluto might try to influence you and pull you back from being too uh, too excited about things. Yes. The schmoozing aspect? No, oh, I didn't say anything about charm. I, all I said was charisma. Mars Neptune. Mars Neptune is by far, Neptune is the planet that spiritualizes energy. And uh, Neptune Mars is very strong charismatically. Schmoozer would be somewhere else. That would be more like Venus Neptune. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a strong positive aspect pattern. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that, but we, we, we don't jump to any conclusions yet. We're just beginning. We've got four more years to go. <laughs> All the, yeah, literally, this course is going to go four more years. I mean, all of that's going to be blended together to the point that you're going to be sick of blending. I mean, don't, don't we have a strength of 452 Yeah, but that's, that, you can't compare charts that way. No, no, there's no, no, you just can't compare, the numbers don't work that way. You can't take one chart and compare it to another. It just doesn't work. It's, it's within a chart. All right, let's look at William Butler Yeats. Now, I found this extremely interesting. Again, with William Butler Yeats, there's very much of a tapering. It's biased toward the high end in that it has a relatively high mean. And uh, quite a few of the aspects are above the mean. Nine aspects are at or above the mean, which is quite something. Or eight are certainly above. All the top five aspects, maybe even six, are very close to each other. So there is, in this case, no single standout aspect. Now, what's interesting is that none of these aspects are standout mental aspects. 
They're, this, the aspect, the tools are not mental. When you compare this to the uh, profile that we, the profiles we drew for the first year in this class, we find out that he had a, a full five planets in airy signs. You had half of the planets in airy signs where you would normally expect a quarter. So we had twice as many airy sign planets as you would expect. Now this shows a very interesting relationship. The airy sign planets indicate intellectual attitudes, mental attitudes. But the aspects indicate that the actions that he takes are from emotions. Venus is at the top. Uh, Venus and Mars is number four. Mars is number five. If Jupiter and Saturn represent macrocosmic emotions like ambitions and things like that, and Mars and Venus indicate personal emotions, all of the top aspects are emotional aspects. So this shows, you know, like this is somebody that's moved by emotion, but the attitude is intellect. So the Shakespeare, for example, in his play shows that Sometimes the mind leads the emotions, and sometimes the emotions lead the mind. In this case, the action is taken on emotion, but the tone of it all is mental. The strongest aspect, the aspect at the top, is Venus joint Pluto, and they are in Taurus. This shows somebody that is exceedingly obsessive or exceedingly, uh, oh, how would you say it, stubborn. Somebody who's not going to change easy. I think what happens here is that the character is that there is a quality of self-demanding of himself as far as his poetry is concerned, that it has to be exact to the right word in order for his aesthetic to come through. And he won't budge from it at all. The fact that Venus and Pluto are in the third house indicates something like that. The top three aspects have either Saturn or Pluto in them. And that shows, again, somebody who's exceptionally deep. You know, like Ethel Barrymore, who we just looked at, was very charismatic. She had a lot of uh, spiritual magnetism about her, and she could move audiences. But she isn't deep, and she isn't deliberate, and she doesn't go for control the way this chart does. A lot of Saturn, a lot of Pluto, a lot of control. So both in macrocosm and microcosm, this looks at world desires and individual desires. One of those planets of Mars, Venus, Saturn, or Jupiter is in each of every aspect that is above the mean. Any questions about this one? Look at that. We're almost done already. We're halfway through. Saturn and Jupiter, yeah. The uh, Saturn and Jupiter are considered planets that have to do with large-scale ambition. Or if you have an ethos, that's a Jupiterian kind of thing, the, um, uh, uh, a feeling of an ethical value at, that applies to a society is a Jupiterian thing. Whereas personal morals and personal emotions like who I love individually is a Venus thing and my personal passion is more like Mars, and Mars, for example, can be industrious, but it can't be ambitious unless it is or something like Saturn. So the greater desire world and for the, the for the whole world is Saturn and Jupiter, and for the individual person is for Mars and Venus. When we get further on and we start studying uh, the emotionality, we're going to go into that uh, quite a bit in detail, and we're going to even uh, study that uh, elaborately.
to all the classes in the future, Jack. None of these right now. <laughs> this is this is like trying to do an end run. You keep running further on, further on, and you never turn the corner. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah, well, well that's all coming. You you jump in the gun. <laughs> No, no, that's no, that's that's next week. Next week we'll go. Yeah. You've waited all these years without this, and you've done perfectly fine. All right, let's look at Shirley MacLaine. Yes. Rarely that I treat somebody who is a living individual. Again, this is sort of like the first chart. One standout aspect, no, like the second chart, I have more. One standout aspect, and then after that, everything tapers very, very gradually, very, very evenly. So it is one standout thing, and, uh, it has a relatively weak mean, weaker than some of them we've seen. Not quite as weak as Van Gogh, but relatively weak. The standout aspect is Mercury opposite Jupiter. So, this is somebody that's likely to be careless. Yes. All right. This is somebody... If you're going to be involved with Shirley MacLaine, you better have good ears. Because this is somebody that's going to want to talk and talk and talk and talk. She's going to be bubbling out all the time. And with Jupiter in the first house, this would be somebody that would be pleasant to be around. Always very smiley, very outward, very optimistic would just be uh, bursting out with more and more things to have to say all the time. There is no discernible trend, you know, like we said that some of the charts were controlled at the top or some of the charts were in a given way at the bottom. There is no discernible trend throughout the whole length of the table of aspects in their relative strengths. That means that uh, in terms of the way she applies actions or the way she applies talents or the frequency, she doesn't have any major thing where she's bringing all of her canons together to accomplish it. It's sort of a miscellaneous chart. And somebody that's not specializing or taking a particular angle of attack. Okay. You got it, you, Jerry, you was... Uh, that's coming up tonight, yes. No, no. But you get it. All you get from that is a feel for what the estimation system is like. No. Because it because it changes so rapidly. The thing that you'll find is that at least is shown in all of these charts, is that when there are strong patterns of aspects all working together, they are what produce high means. And not a several standout individual aspects, but usually an aspect pattern. So that's what John Don was trying to point out before, and uh, I think he was perfectly right in that. Yes? Yes. Yes, careless, reckless, both. 
I would say more careless than reckless. There's an overconfidence and there's a thing like, oh, I don't have to bother with this. I have a Mercury squared Jupiter and I paint with an extremely broad brush many times and I don't look at a lot of significant little details. Yeah. Reckless is usually a little bit more if you put Mars with Jupiter or Uranus or something like that. Even Mars Mercury can be a little, little reckless. No, I was looking, now, like in some of these, there were a lot of Pluto aspects in the bunching at the top. Pluto or Saturn, and you could see that this predominated the character and gave it a shading of heaviness and of control and things like that. But if you look at this list, it's very miscellaneous, it's very mixed up. So there's not only a tapering effect, but it, it, the consistency is such that no one thing is favored over another. That is, is a, a general, uh, uh, how do they call it, Oya Polida or something like that. Isn't that the right word? I don't know how to pronounce it in Spanish. O-L-L-A-P-O-R-I-D-A. -L -L -A -A. It's a sweet tooth that they sell in Spain and in Latin American countries that they pour everything in. Uh, the Oya is a, uh, is a urn of some kind, and the Torida is a porridge of things. So uh, I'll pass on that. I'm not even sure that I know what you're saying. That's, yeah, that's opposite the natural chart. And you'd expect the personal stuff to be below the horizon. Um, yes, uh, the thing that you're saying that I think is significant are all the conjunctions. But conjunctions, I don't think, are the natural state of things. Conjunctions, conjunctions are, yes, for her they are, yes, but they're at the beginning and at the end. Now, if it were a natural chart, you would take the cosmic mandala and you would expect to see Aries or near Aries on the ascendant, and all the personal planets would be beneath the Earth, whereas all of the universal planets would be above the Earth, and that's that's the cosmic standard in, in the mandala. Right. Uh, I'll pass on that. <laughs> uh, yes, I think with the conjunction of Mars and the sun, uh, it should be very likely to uh, be associated with men more than with women. In fact, uh, I have a friend that has Mars sun aspect that is sometimes the only woman in a room of 300 men. <laughs> you know who that is? The friend of hers. Yes. Uh, I didn't say anything about that. Uh, that's, again, one of the uh, uh, hodgepodge aspects. And when I say hodgepodge, I'm saying if you could look down the line, there's no particular trend. Saturn Uranus usually has to do with the uh, new and the old. And having a strong aspect, positive aspect like that, would indicate, especially the sextile, would indicate that she can reflect from the old and find herself doing very well in the new thing. Saturn is tradition, and Saturn is history, and Uranus is everything all brand new. And uh, she's one of those people that belongs to an old generation, but does perfectly well with the young new age generation. which we will hear more about than we want to. I still haven't read out on a limb yet. That's that's still coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm saving that. That's, uh, 
Uh, I don't know. Oh, I have to read some more then. All right, Cat Stevens. Interesting in that you have uh, three strong aspects at the top, three aspects, weak aspects at the bottom, and everything else is sort of mediocre. It's almost like he bought the top ones at the top, and uh, from the uh, loss of the ones at the bottom. But I can't, I can't quite accept that kind of thinking. The uh, strongest aspect, clearly, and stand out is the moon trying Mars, which means he has to pour out his emotions, and they have to be fluent. And they have to flow and do so quickly. All of the top three aspects which are bunched up there are extremely fluent aspects. There's something very interested, interesting in this, in that the number two and number three aspects are both between octaves. Mercury, Neptune, uh, the octave of the mind, and Venus Uranus, the octave of love. And when you find octave aspects, especially if they're strong, you have something very spontaneous. So when two of the top three aspects are the only two possible, you find that this is an extremely spontaneous individual, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if most of his famous songs were improvised and not something that he spent hour after hour after hour uh, working them out to get it just exactly the way he wanted. I think that they just came out of him poof, just like that. There are very few aspects in the top and the significant ones that are uh, fixating or controlling or reacting, his religion is a matter of emotion. And I think intuitive emotion. That from all of the top aspects except number two, the top five are all emotional things. So he has a feel for a religion. And that is the way he accomplishes things. Feeling. And so with his feelings flowing and with the improvisational nature, his songs sort of ripple like water. Is, have any of you ever heard Moon Shadow? That's, that's ex exactly what you kind of, it's kind of weird and eerie like, you know, it has that octave quality about it. Alright, questions on any of this? Michael says, how do I get all of that? stuff that he is improvisational. I want to be an improvisational songwriter. Yeah. Yep. That's because you've never been in any of these classes. <laughs> it's a common misunderstanding. What? You have phenomenal realms. They're the phenomenal realms. They represent concrete thought. Oh, I'll get this out of the way. Concrete thought. Emotion. Desire. Energy. Or 
vitality and dense physical stuff. In the phenomenal realms, things have beginnings and ends. They're all concrete. In the transcendent realms, we have ideas. We have life spirits. Which is pure imagination or pure love, pure wisdom. And you have divine spirits. Which is will. The things that Neptune and Uranus stand for are things that are transcendental. But since they focus as planets in the phenomenal world, they have a phenomenal presence. You know, like in the dense world, there's a dense Uranus and there's a dense Neptune. So, Transcendentally, Uranus means one thing. Phenomenally, it means another. And there's always, when it goes through the lens of the mind or through the lens of creativity, things get flipped over. And the nearest to the lens here is the nearest to the lens here. So, Neptune, when you see it in the phenomenal realm, Neptune is very feminine. It's very passive. It's like somebody in a drug stupor. Or it's like a passive medium. Or, you know, something that's, someone that's in a malaise. And for that reason, people thought that Neptune was feminine and was the octave of Venus. But Neptune in its real sense is in a realm of magic. It's in a realm of being able to control things. And so if you're taking it as an octave, you're not looking at it in the phenomenal world, you're looking at it as an octave of something in the phenomenal world, and it then becomes a supra-rational planet. The ability, because I have, I have uh, Mercury sextile Neptune, and I have the ability to spontaneously speak. Just give me a subject on it and I can think and I can tune in it's the tune in aspect so on the uh, if you're taking on the true octave level then Uranus is masculine then the divine feminine the life spirit principle is the feminine love principle that wins by losing and constantly gives of itself but when it gets reflected into the emotional uh, into the desire world it works more with mechanics and technical things like that, but it still does it by feeling. It does it by feeling. I, I went, I talked to strongly Iranian uh, mechanics, for example, garage mechanics. We'll talk to them and say, "How do you know this works?" Or when you work with electronics people, they feel it first, and then the, lo the logic comes later. So on the transcendental level, Uranus is feminine. And it is the octave of Venus. But when it's on the phenomenal level, it takes the quality of life of being technical. All right, does it make sense? So you have to remember where it's coming from, but you also have to remember the fact that it is the planet in the phenomenal world. And therefore, it's going to have two meanings. One, the, the, as a phenomenal planet, Uranus as a technical planet is just a reflective. It isn't its true nature. Its true nature is in the transcendent. And it's just, it's just sort of a body that reflects in a given way. Ah, uh, there is no other. There's only one other octave. You have Pluto, Pluto dealing with will, and Mars would be down in the plane of energy. And Venus is here. The, the, the dense physical, uh, there is no octave for that that I know of. Now, this is not new to me. This has been around uh, 
with spiritual astrology for a long time. The earliest I come into it in writing is from a theosophical uh, astrologer named Alan Leal in England. I think his name was real name was Morrison or Gorn Old, one or the other. That's the right. That's that's right in the center. This is where the sun. When you're looking at this surface, this is the higher self. When you're looking at this surface, it's the ego. But Jupiter is here. As far, if it's just ideas, it's here. But if it's as a spiritual uh, focus of the ideas from the Neptunian chaos, yeah. In fact, if you look at the third member of the Trinity in India, the Shiv principle. Trident, the Jupiter figure, and the Sun. Uh, if you, in, if you, it's in Hindu iconography. You can find that this same principle that I've just given to you has been there for thousands of years. All right. What? No. Mm -mm. Neptune always has a rationale. It's sometimes a very strange rationale, but it always has a rationale. <laughs> Jerry's saying, yes, I know somebody like that. All right, we're looking at Simone de Beauvoir. In this case, there are two bunches. It's like a, going to a racetrack. There's one bunch of leading horses and one bunch of trailing. The first five are one bunch and the last six are another bunch. This is an interesting chart in terms of history. The strongest aspect is between octave planets, between Uranus and Neptune. And this means that she was a child of the Second World War when there was that division between Uranus and Neptune. And that opposition between Uranus and Neptune marked the point where the cycle was turning over from the Neptune half, which would be the spiritual masculine half, to the spiritual feminine half. During the spiritual masculine is when all the great occultists were around. Adam Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Rudolf Steiner overlapped Max Heindel, all of the uh, new schools of astrology happened during the Neptune half of that cycle. At this opposition, things turn over to the spiritual feminine, to Uranus. And so you might say that she's in on the ground floor or the beginning of the ascendancy of the spiritual feminine, with that Oranian kind of quality. So she's extremely representative of that turnaround time. Things pull back and forth always, but it isn't a, a clean turn from uh, one one state to the other. And so this is a generation that if you read the philosophers of the uh, Uranus opposite Neptune generation, they're extremely indecisive. They pull this way, they pull that way, they pull this way, they pull that way. What's interesting about this is being born in one war and coming to her prime in another war is shown that all five of the top aspects are malefics. Top five, maybe even the top six are malefics. <coughs> this shows that she builds within an atmosphere of conflict. It shows that she pits herself or pits ideas against other ideas. She's troubled in her own life, but she thrives on it. There have been people who have become saints who have had a lot of malefics in their chart. 
Again, looking at this, there's no specific flavor trend in the top five. Uranus and Neptune are, sp are spiritual. Saturn and Pluto are dark and heavy, but Mercury and Neptune are uh, sort of uh, volatile. And Moon and Mars are extremely emotional. And Mercury and Uranus are again kind of intellectually volatile, but there's no common trend there. So you can't say that she's all bent in one thing, uh, which can be either good or bad. It means that she has a variety of things that she's interested in and that she works at. Does the Uranus opposite Neptune describe her as someone conflicted or part of that spiritually indecisive generation? I think so, but that's that that I had that biography I haven't read yet either. And I haven't read the uh the second sex, which I also have ready all queued up for reading. Yes. We are now in the occult cycle again, because from her time until the conjunction just a few years ago when the uh, Soviet Union was falling apart, it was the Uranus part of the cycle. Now this, this is one of the reasons why you can expect that the occult things are going to come back to the uh, foreground again. Well, it's it's Uranus and Neptune from the from the conjunction to the opposition. One is the other is the mysticism. Yeah, the Neptunian. The first half of the cycle is dominated by Neptune, and the second half is dominated by Uranus. And right now we're in the first half, and so things are swinging toward the occult again. And we certainly expect that again. One is the path of knowledge and of works. And of power, and the other is the path of healing, and of faith, and of acceptance. Basically, a person has to be uh, both, has to balance both. But the way it works is, when the spinal fire rises, if you put it through the heart first, then you're more likely to stress the mystical side of things, and you're likely to be a feeling, feeling for mystic. If you bring the spinal fire up first and go into the brain through the voice box, you do that before coming back on the return trip, it, it forms a lemnus gap. And you can either go this way or that way with it. Uh, some uh, some occultists feel that uh, eventually we'll, we'll have a twin spine and that both energies will rise equally. Uh, if you look in the Bible, if you look in, not in the Gospels, but in the Apostles that followed the Gospels, there were struggles in the early church between those who believed that salvation came by faith and, uh, and those who believed that faith without works was nothing. And that's a common struggle that has been in spiritual seeking throughout all of humanity. Some people are completely accepting and they just love them their way into heaven. Others take a little bit more dangerous path and they try to control things magically or they try to understand things philosophically and they live more creative lives. And so when it is going from the conjunction of Uranus and Neptune until the opposition, Neptune rules and it gives power to Uranus and Uranus just acts as a shuttlecock. And then on the other half of the cycle, when Uranus gives the energy back to Neptune, then the, the mystics are, are more in line at that point. All right. Uh, I don't have a statement about that right now yet. I think the time to look for it, which is still a few days off, uh, is when uh, the moon passes over it for the first time, you get your first uh, view of it. I've mentioned the fact before that th this has historic precedence behind it. And that is uh, a cycle or so ago when Uranus entered Leo, uh, there was there were the two largest fires in the United States at the same 
time and they were started at the same moment because they were on the same meridian. There was a Chicago fire and the Peshtigo forest fire both started on the same day at the same hour. And uh, that was the first time that the moon passed over Uranus after Uranus entered into Leo, which is a sign of big fire, not just a flash, flash in the pan like Aries or a uh, you know a visual fire like like Sagittarius, it's like big glowing fire, and that's the only thing that you can see that would make that that would show but by looking at the cycles like that is the only way that you can see that describes why that fire would be on that day and at that hour. Uh, what? I, I puzzled over it for a long time and I mailed back and forth because I thought it was significant that they were on the same meridian of longitude and they and they both started at the same hour. Uh, I thought that, that that there should be something significant astrologically and I you know, I passed charts back and forth with other astrologers and nothing made any sense until you looked at it in the sense of cycles and the triggering of cycles. Uh, in fact, you can look at every trigger that comes along for, for the first few years or so. You know, the first time that the sun passes over Uranus in uh, Pisces, which is almost a year away, that should be significant too. And Mars will sometime later this year also be passing over. You know, that's, that's another significant trigger. They had the moon over Uranus after Uranus entered into Leo. There may have been a fix. Yes? Yeah, you could, you could expect that there would be some kind of occult advance at that time. Yeah. But, you know, but mind you, you're dealing with many cycles going on simultaneously. And it's much easier to just sit down and feel what's in the air, or look at the newspaper and look what's in the air, rather than to try and calculate all the cycles. Oh, this is doing this one, this one is doing that. It's just a really complex because you get unary cycles and binary cycles and binary cycles, and it gets it gets really hard intellectually to to get the dope of where the universe is at at any given minute. It's it's not all easy. All right. Any other questions, comments, disagreements? I almost sound like a rag peddler or something like that. <laughs> All right. Now we have Herman Hess. This is uh, another chart where they're bunched at the top and sort of bunched at the bottom. It's not clearly as bunched. Strongest standout aspect. Mercury, sextile, Uranus. Fact of the matter is Herman Hess noted for his ingenuity and inventiveness. And by book sales, an entire generation of spiritual seekers would say yes. Because he really had some ingenious ways of saying things. He was noted for his ingenuity in how he said it but not necessarily for explaining, which would be more a Neptunian kind of thing. He just presented it to you in very unique ways. So it looked very clearly at what the, at what the action of consciousness that Herman Hess is noted for does agree with what we're doing here by trying to estimate. This is not an especially exaggerated chart in any way. And again, there's no special trend that I could see at, at all in the chart that it's especially mental or it's especially heavy or especially fixated. Some, there's not, nothing like that. It's a pretty well-blended, well-balanced kind of chart. Fluent all the way through. He's one of the first of the modern writers take into account uh, depth psychology. He's a friend of Carl Jung and underwent uh, therapy himself 
in which we would expect again also from a material anus kind of person. All right. Yeah, they would be new or first or would be would would put that right in part of the writing. Oranus likes to set precedence. It likes to be the first or the new or the do something odd and different that's never been done before. <laughs> Speculative new things. Yeah. Uh Mercury, uh, Uranus, Jupiter is always highly speculative, especially if there's a Mercury aspect in there to focus it. Because otherwise, when you have aspects between outer planets, planets outside of Mars, it's sometimes hard to get them into play because uh, they are so much for all of society and not for the individual. This is an interesting chart. The mean is 48 which means that the mean is near aspect number 8. And because everything above the mean is so strong, everything from 9 to the end is just about negligible. You don't have to think about those things at all. They hardly play a part in, uh, in her life. It's, a, it's her. We're Elizabeth Taylor. We have two aspects that are very, very close. They have the same percentage. They're two estimation points apart, but they're virtually equal to each other. They are Mercury conjunct Sun and Venus conjunct Uranus. Are these the things that she's known for? I would say that the Venus conjunct Uranus is what she's noted for in the first half of her life. And the Mercury conjunct Sun is what she's most noted for in the second half of her life. Venus conjunct Uranus is one of the falling in love aspects. Only it's hyper romantic. And of people in the 20th century, probably Nobody is known in the world more for big romantic love affairs than Elizabeth Taylor. So we're accurate in that account. Mercury conjoined Sun, both are in uh, Pisces. In the second half of her life, she's noted for not only being highly compassionate, but for being a spokesperson for all of the people who are downtrodden or are in strange conditions, both person for gays and for uh, AIDS people, both person for alcoholics, and then that one special weird class, <laughs> spokesperson for Michael Jackson. <laughs> you knew what was coming already. So it's clearly accurate. In, uh, in, in, in guessing. Again, two of the top three, number two and number three, are again aspects between octaves. So she has a good deal of spontaneity. And I think because of Mercury Neptune, I think there's some uh, foot and mouth uh, disease there and she probably uh, regrets all the babbling that she does. Now, if you look at this and compare it to Ethel Barrymore, Ethel Barrymore had a lot of Neptunian qualities also, very strong near the top. But Ethel Barrymore's are more of a charisma. This has more of a romance and more of a mystique about it. And it's interesting that all of the top five aspects could be considered afflictions. And Elizabeth Taylor is known much more for her flaws and for her weaknesses in life than for any talent or any special qualities or abilities that she has. She's just known as the queen of weaknesses in some ways. 
and she's loved for it. And it's just quite interesting the way that stands out. All right, any questions, comments? Uh, Be considered an affliction? No, be considered just... Mercury is the, is the vocal planet. It is the planet of speech and writing. So it and makes no difference if it's in Pisces. That's or right. Any other. right. What? Yes, yeah, so that's alright. That's perfectly fine. Hi. Thanks for coming by. Yes. Well, the fifth house is expressive, but uh, Mercury is always the mouthpiece. In a gang, uh, Mercury is the one that starts the fight so that the fighters, the martial types, can do the fighting. But they have to have the Mercury there to have the trash talk and all of that. Mm-hmm. That means that she, the strip of, no, uh, I think what happens is that the Uranus square, a conjunct Venus kicks in first, and she falls deliriously in love, and she's like, you know, like violins in the top register, and she's in a waft of perfume and everything else, and then the Venus Pluto comes in later, and she becomes fixated. And even when it's failing, she's going to try and make it work, even when it isn't working. It's, uh, Venus, Venus square Pluto does not like to give up on love or forever. It's not as, quite as pornographic in a female's chart as it is in a male's chart, but Venus Pluto can be a pornographic aspect. Um, in this case, since Pluto's in the tenth house, I think it would be that um, the power of scandal and the power of notoriety uh, gets is what controls her more than the partner. Uh, you know, like Eddie Fisher wasn't strong enough to control her. Richard Burton came the closest of anyone, but it indicates that she falls in love with people who have power. Uh, when she was was with John Warner, she certainly had all kinds of power in that. In that, uh, she was bored with him after a while. You know, he sort of was. There were no violins. Uh, I did one other thing. I had time for do one other little thing. I took and did what somebody asked. There are a bunch of other things I want to do with the numbers while I'm doing this, but I don't know when I'll get around to it. And I'm still loath to make those charts that people want because I don't want to fix everything in the concrete. And if I make a chart, it's going to be fixed in the concrete and there'll be no growing in the system and there will be no experimenting. The, uh, between all of the charts, our 16 charts, the mean mean is 44.55. Meaning to say that you can look at the way the system works, that you can look at that for being something like the average. The lowest mean that we have is Vincent van Gogh, which is 36.83, which means that he accomplished an awful lot with not any particular uh, ready-built talent. In fact, if you read his works and follow his progress, he did not have a lot of skill as an artist as an artist to begin with. And it didn't become real quickly. He had to work at it. There was not a, there was not a talent ready built. The strongest or the highest mean is Louisa Alcott, fifty nine point six zero. As I recall she had a small number of aspects, meaning to say that she had a few tools that were really, really well developed. And that's as much as I have prepared tonight. Out of the means? Uh, it's just a way to get, if you, 
it's not comparing charts, but it's to give you an idea over all people what how 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 it works out in somebody's life. It's it like as far as Van Gogh is concerned. I th I think you, what you could say is that um, having such not real intense aspects, I think you could say that the free will, which goes beyond astrology, was able to use what he had and to get quite a bit out of it. And as far as Louisa Alcott is concerned, I don't have a conclusion about that. Yet. I, I may have some more along the way. It's, it's bound to come up as we go through the charts. And get them. Yeah. 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 Yes, I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that the mean is a useless thing, except that over many, many charts you get a feel for for something in general. That's that's what. If it were just a matter of a mean, we would just look at the mean and we wouldn't do anything else. But what we're doing is we're actually looking at the range of aspects, which is a much more sensible thing to do. Uh, some of the other things I want to do with the numbers is to see what and how much things are changed by the little tables in there, what percentage, you know, what which what causes the greatest amounts of increases and the greatest amount of decreases. Steve, you asked a question about that first because I would expect, for example, that people born during the time of the Great Conjunction, which is about three or four years ago, mm -hmm. that the mean would be very high. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's 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 a rare event, but it it is it isn't as strong as like that uh, T square that Crazy Horse was born in. It is an aspect pattern that Crazy Horse was born in. The Crazy Horse is the second strong. It's very close to Louisa Alcott. It doesn't have to be any particular aspect. It's how close yes. Are. Yeah. So because. Yeah, the, right. You you got the sense of it because because they move so rapidly, it's constantly changing. If you did what you're suggesting for the outer planets from Jupiter on out, then it might make sense. But the inner planets, it, with the inner planets, it doesn't make sense. No, I don't think I, after years and years and years, I've never found anything like that. No, no. Somebody can be born from almost anywhere in the world, and somebody can be born in almost any kind of times. Some people are more representative of their times, and some people just work out of the blue from nowhere and just do their own independent thing. I, I've never found anything. I don't know. I don't know. Like among the flower children, like if you take Bob Dylan and John Lennon, they do their their charts do focus the, the interpersonal planets do focus the big things that were the sign of the times in the second world war. Okay. My goodness, we almost got an hour and a half out of it again. That's a way of looking at it, yeah. Secret agent. Agent inside the film industry. Oh, yeah. Her destiny is to write about the things in general. Yeah. 